Greetings, and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the Calamus section, and we now turn to an amazing little poem, These I Singing in Spring. Now, Whitman loves to kind of play around with syntax or grammar or word order, and here's a classic example of it. And, then, and of course, there's the absence often of commas when you would expect a comma to be there. And, and, and I think he's, like I said to you guys before, I think he's having a great bit of fun as he's uh, writing and producing these poems. Now, our assumption is that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net. Down the left-hand side, find that playlist, Talks with Walt. All the way from the inscriptions and starting from Pamanak as part of those inscriptions, poems, we're going to reference that here in a bit, up through the last poem of the Calamus section for you, O Democracy. Now, Nortons will tell us, for background information, that the antecedent for, quote, these, that's the first line and obviously the title of the poem, is apparently the tokens of line 14, which the poet collects for lovers. But of them all, only the Calamus root, drawn from the water by the poolside, possesses a special significance for those who, quote, love as I myself am capable of loving, end quote. In his 1860 manuscript, Whitman considered, but fortunately abandoned, Norton says, the sentimental title, As I Walk Alone at Candlelight. It's always fascinating to know that Whitman was playing around with some of these other kinds of titles. The poem took its present title in 1867 and remained unchanged uh, thereafter. Now, I want to start, actually, with just a bit of a reminder. Do you remember these lines from starting from Pominoc 6? Now, of course, we gave full exegesis of these lines earlier, but I just want to remind you of them because the echoes are remarkable. I will sing. This is that I will passage that has so many of those I wills. I will sing the song of companionship. I will show what alone must finally compact these. I believe these are to, uh, these are to found their own ideal of Manly love, we're going to obviously hear about this in the Calamus section over and over, indicating it in me. I will therefore let flame from me the burning fires that were threatening to consume me. I will lift what has too long kept down those smoldering fires. I will give them complete abandonment. I will write the evangel poem of comrades and of love. Of course, this idea of comrades we've already seen in Calamus. We're going to see it more. For who but I should understand love with all its sorrow and joy. We're going to hear some of this in the very poem we're about to study. And who but I should be the poet of comrades. Let's now turn to the poem itself, These I Sing in Spring. And uh, let's go to work now with uh, the sets of lines. Now, uh, because of the length of this one, I'm not going to read it in its entirety and then come back. We'll just work through it thought by thought. He begins. These I Singing in spring, collect for lovers, and then the parenthetic, for who but I should understand lovers in all their sorrow and joy, literally, the, the exact same quote from starting from Pamana, and who but I should be the poet of comrades, again, just go back and look at the lines I just read from Pamana 6, right, notice we'll begin with singing, we're hearing this all the way through, the last line of the uh, previous poem for you, O Democracy, was trilling these songs, here it's singing, I want to point out right away at 2B, notice all of the I-N-G kinds of words, whether they're gerunds or participles, it doesn't matter. Watch, notice, and see how he uses this I-N-G language to create a certain kind of rhythm. He loves these parenthetics. We've seen this before in Leaves of Grass. These asides. Notice spring. These I singing in spring. And the collection of these, what will later be tokens, right? for lovers. And of course, we've seen the word love and lovers all the way through Leaves of Grass. It's fascinating the way that Whitman will play around with that word in so many different ways. And then he asks this interesting set of rhetorical questions, two of them. For who but I should understand lovers in all their sorrow and joy? And again, these lines lifted from the Pominoch section, but it's fascinating the way in which he asks, who but I? That is to say, I am the poet most acquainted with lovers and, of course, the sorrow and the joy. That dualism as well, of course, is significant. And who but I should be the poet of comrades? In other words, this rhetorical question, I am the poet of comrades. Again, we, we've already commented on this earlier in some of our earlier Calamus poems. 
then the word collecting. You know, this idea of collecting takes us back to the first line with collect. This idea of bringing together, right? Collecting I traverse. I told you guys, Whitman loves the idea of journeys. He learned it from his study of Homer's Odyssey, and here it's traverse. And we're going to see it, of course, most maybe beautifully represented in Song of the Open Road, a foot and lighthearted I take to the open road. Collecting, I traverse the garden, the world. And of course, the garden, the world makes us think of children of Adam, makes us think of our Milton as well, right? But soon, I pass the gates. We think we have to think about Milton. But we're already thinking about this passing of the gates, and here in a little bit it's going to be stones. And we're going to get the sense that Whitman is trying to be a progressive thinker as he's showing us, I am moving beyond the past. I think there's a reason why he keeps referencing Homer in the Odyssey, right? Now, notice he loves the word here and he loves the word now, especially in this poem, immediacy. Now, along the pond side, we've seen this before in Song of Myself, the pond side now waiting in a little, notice how many times waiting, wandering, traversing, all of this is going to happen. Waiting in a little, of course, we think immediately of, I will you to be a bold swimmer. That is to say, drop that plank from passage 46 of Song of Myself. He says, now, waiting in a little, fearing not the wet. Now, by the post and rail fences where the old stones were thrown there. A whole lot has been made of the old stones, the old ideas. And of course, if you're going to think about your T.S. Eliot as well, in four quartets as well as in Hollow Man, think about the power of the idea of uh, lips that would just form prayers to broken stone, the idea of stones, right? The old stones thrown there, that is to say the old ideas. In other words, we're moving beyond the old ideas. Picked, notice the alighted verb, from the fields have accumulated. And then notice a, again, we'll have a second parenthetic, wildflowers and vines and weeds. Obviously, we've got all kinds of symbolism potentially happening here in a text that's called Leaves of Grass, right? Come up through the stones and partly cover them beyond these I pass. Before it was diverse, now it's past. Notice, in other words, Whitman loves to kind of imagine himself as the modern, we would, of course, for his day call him modern, modern Odysseus. And here he is, he's going on this journey, and he's passing past all of these old things. We've seen this idea, of course, in inscriptions a number of times, right? Far, far, notice the repetition. Far, far in the forest, and of course the forest is, is symbolic. We can write down in 3A already, Thoreau's Walden. Far, far in the forest, or sauntering. Think about that word sauntering. And for those of you that are like, where did I hear that echo? It comes from the poem, Poets to Come, from the inscription section. We've already talked about it. Remember these lines? I am a man who, sauntering along without fully stopping, turns a casual look upon you, averts his face. Do you remember this set of lines? That saunter, it's a great word. He loved that word. Sauntering later in summer. Notice we've gone from spring to summer. Before I think where... I go. It's interesting. In other words, I'm going to move out before I actually give much thought to it, and I'm going to get on with the thing I've got to do, which is obviously, you know, leaps of grass, right? These poems. Solitary. Well, we'll immediately start thinking about the number of times in Leaves of Grass where this idea of the solitary bird, the solitary singer, is at play. Solitary. Smelling the earthy smell. Stopping now and then in the silence. Alone. I had thought yet soon a troop gathers around me. It's interesting that he uses the wartime language of troop. He thought he was alone, but then he realizes, oh, I'm gathering readers of my poems to me, and I'm not alone. This idea that the poet longs to somehow be accepted and to be included. Some walk by my side and some behind and some embrace my arms or neck. I told you this idea of embracing keeps coming back over and over again in Leaves of Grass. And of course, necks are a big part of it. Even I hear America singing, go back to it. They, the spirits of dear friends, dead or alive. Now these dear friends, of course, can be literally friends of Whitman, or they can be ideas and people that he's read from the past. Thicker they come, a great crowd, and I, in the middle. By the way, here, notice all these ING words that will start to come. And we cannot think about a line like this without thinking about Dante. Remember when he's with Virgil as he enters limbo? And of course, yeah, all the poets are there. And there's Dante, of course, in the middle of all of those great poets. It's interesting, in the middle of the way, Dante will say, we've given full lectures on divine comedy at learnstrong.net. Collecting 
dispensing, singing, there I wandered with them. And again, we're back to Odysseus and our wandering. Plucking something for tokens. And there, of course, is the antecedent, though, though uh, the words used earlier, these. Here's the antecedent, possibly. We're going to hear tokens one more time with token of comrades in a few lines. Tossing toward whatever is near me. Here. And notice the use of the words here now. Here, lilac, key, key symbol. We're going to see it when, um, in, in the Lincoln section when lilac lasts to the door of bloom. Here, lilac with a branch of pine. Notice all of these different types of flowers. Some have tried to read some symbolism in terms of the selection of the different types of, of uh, you know, foliage that's referenced here. Here, out of my pocket is an interesting phrase. Some moss, we're going to see this in the uh, um, Louisiana live oak uh, growing a poem that's coming. Some have considered that the most important poem of Calamus, which I pulled off a live oak in Florida. Notice here it's Florida, not Louisiana. We'll get to it later. As it hung trailing down, all kinds of clear symbolism here and phallic symbolism as well here. Here, some pinks and laurel leaves. Of course, this idea of laurel taking us back to uh, Apollo and Daphne and the stories that we've lectured on it at Wernstrom.net, and a handful of sage. In other words, all these different kinds of flowers and fauna that he is selecting. And here, what I now draw, notice between here and now, from the water, waiting in the pond side. Earlier it was wandered, now it's waiting. And then there's, the, again, a parenthetic. Oh, here I last saw him that tenderly loves me and returns again, never to separate from me. And this, oh, this shall henceforth be the token of comrades. This calamus root shall interchange it with youths, with each other, exclamation point. Let none render it back, exclamation point, end of parenthetics. Of course, the calamus root is foundational to why we've got this set of poems called calamus, right? In other words, the idea of manly attraction, adhesiveness, and that ability to uh, be together. And he's now back to more uh, uh, referencing to foliage and growth. And twigs, notice it'll be twigs, it'll be stems, it'll be plum blooms. And twigs of maple, and a bunch of wild orange and chestnut, and stems of currants and plum blows, and the aromatic cedar. Notice all this listing. And of course all this symbolic. In other words, his poetry, he wants to argue, is of the earth. Organic, natural, you decide how you want to read these lines. These, back to the opening lines, I compressed, notice this, uh, this um, um, is an unlighted verb again, compressed around by a thick cloud of spirits. Now readers of Whitman's day were acutely familiar with their King James Version of the Bible and their biblical text of Hebrews 12.1 surrounded by a great crowd, a uh, great cloud of, of witnesses. The moment that he uses language like this, th those words would immediately come um, um, uh, to, the, to the readers of Whitman's day for sure. And then the next word takes us back to Odysseus. Wandering, point to, or touch as I pass. I told you the word touch keeps coming back again and again in leaves of grass. Or throw them loosely from me. He loves this word loosely indicating to each one, notice the repetition of the word each, each one what he shall have, giving something to each. But what I drew from the water by the pond side, that I reserve. Now this is fascinating because here he is saying, I'm going to give, 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 but there's something I'm going to hold on to. I will give of it, but only to them that love as I myself am capable of loving. It is interesting that he will finish the poem, suggesting that there are things that he can give away, there are other things that he can't so easily give away, or that he won't so easily give away, because he's going to reserve those for those who truly understand him and the way in which he loves. Now, obviously, there's all kinds of ways to interpret these lines, but let's go ahead and just point out that one obvious message here, and we've seen this before in Leaves of Grass, is the poet is always searching for an audience. He or she really wants to understand who it is that he's giving uh, 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 the poems away to. 
And he wants that individual to understand, in this case, Whitman. He wants to be understood, but not fully understood. There's some things he's going to hold in reserve. At 2B, well, notice all of the ING words, which, again, produce this kind of powerful rhythm, and obviously the symbolism of the leaves and the calamus root, as well as the moss. You can see that. At 3A, well, go back and look at starting from Pamanak at passage number 6. I told you guys when we did those early inscription poems, the way that Leaves of Grass is set up is so that there will be these echoes. Remember, I quoted for you those sets of lines from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, Burnt Norton, My words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves? I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden. Shall we follow? That idea, I think, Eliot learned from Whitman, this ability to kind of bring the echoes again and again. Hey, I'm going to suggest to you that you get ready for I Saw in Louisiana a Live Oak Growing as being a, a, an amazing poem from the Calamus section. We'll come back to some of these ideas. I'm also going to suggest that you think about, we've obviously mentioned our Dante and our Thoreau, but I'm going to throw at you as well Aristotle's poetics. We've given lectures on poetics. That idea that what makes art so compelling is that the artist wants to somehow reach the audience through the uh, idea of per catharsis or purgation. Finally, at 3B, what was a time, just to try and own this poem, what was a time that you wished your song could be accepted and maybe was accepted or was not accepted? And to what degree for you is that something that you still are grappling with? Another question for you is, what are your tokens? What are those things which you are trying to both share as well as maybe in some ways reserve? I hope that Whitman is challenging you with his tokens. Thank you.